Greetings gamers, my name is Anto, and today I'm gonna to show you how I use the affinity suite of tools to make products to sell for TTRPGs. This video is sponsored by Dungeons & Lasers 5, the world of Deus Lair, more on them later. This is a video a lot of folks have wanted me to make ever since I first showed off the campaign setting guides that I make for my players. Folks have wanted to know how can they make products that look like that without having to get the Adobe suite. And I use the Affinity suite. I currently use Affinity 2, but most of this will apply to Affinity 1 as well. So to show you how I do this, I'm gonna lay out an issue of SideQuest Magazine, which is my monthly RPG magazine. I'll link in the description for that. And we're gonna walk through all of the different things that I do to get a product ready to be published. So here we are in Affinity Publisher. Everything we're gonna to do today can be done within Publisher itself, but these apps do communicate with each other. You can use Affinity Designer and Photo, and each of those have their own tools that can be really useful. And you can open projects in any of those options to be able to give you more choice and more flexibility when it comes to doing interesting things in terms of the layout. But today we're just gonna to stick to Publisher. We're gonna keep it as simple as possible. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna create a new document and we wanna set everything up. This is especially important if you're gonna be printing your documents, you wanna make sure to get this set up properly. If you plan on making a product sell on DMs Guild or DriveThruRPG, both of those sites have their own guidelines and their own templates, including publisher templates that I recommend you go download, it will bring in all of the important information that you need and you don't have to mess around with trying to fix things after the fact, which can be really annoying because DriveThruRPG is really particular with the kind of settings that it wants. Trust me, learn from my mistakes, just go download their template to pull in all of the margin information and the size and things like that if you intend on print publishing on either of those platforms. So we're gonna start ahead, we're gonna go ahead and hit new document. We're gonna choose a print document. I like to work in US letter. That is what most of the kind of big, well-known published books like the 5e and Pathfinder books are published in that format. So I like to match that as closely as possible. So we choose US letter over here and then we've got several tabs down here. So we've got our layout, which will include our DPI, that's our kind of resolution dots per inch we want to leave that at 300 and then we can choose our document units whether we want to work in inches or millimeters pixels we can work in feet and yards wouldn't recommend it for something this small but we're going to leave that at inches just because everything that we're going to be doing is referenced in inches when it comes to things like drive through rpg they reference all of their guidelines and margins in inches so we'll just keep it nice and simple then we're going to go to pages and we want to make sure that facing pages is turned on if we're making a multi-page document. That will show us a spread instead of a single page, and it'll show us how things move between pages in a physical format. Choose our alignment and what page we want to start on and how many pages we're going to do. So we're going to start off with like 12 pages, and then we're going to go into color. Color is a really important one. If you want to print, change color to CMYK. Don't leave it on RGB because it will cause your printers all kinds of headaches. We're also going to hit transparent background just so that if we want to play with some fancy effects and some transparency effects that we have that option. Then we're going to go into margins and we want margins in our document and this is where it's going to become really specific to you. Now, I use a specific set of margins that have been set up for previous projects. I always try and keep them the same because it makes my life when I'm collating issues into an annual much, much easier. So my specific settings are 0.697 inches on the inner margin, 0.803 on the outer, 0.5 on the top and one inch on the bottom. Yours will be dictated by whatever project you're doing. If you intend to just sell on drive to RPG and DM skilled, use their margins. It will save you so much trouble. Then in terms of bleed, I like to set three millimeters. So a great thing about Affinity is if I just type that in, even though we've got our unit set to inches, it'll convert that automatically. Then we can see here, document summary, US letter size 8.5 by 11 inches, 300 pixel DPI, CMYK cover, and then we make sure our margins and our bleed are all fine, and we can go ahead and hit create. So a couple of quick tips to help you navigate things really quickly in Affinity publisher if you want to switch between kind of a preview view and then being able to see the different guides and guidelines and things like that on your page hold shift control and w and that will show you your margins and your guides or 
turn them off and give you a more like print preview style. I switch between these all the time while I'm working so I can get a visualization of how things are gonna look on the page. Another thing to note is if you press tab, it gets rid of everything other than the canvas and allows you to really focus in on your work. It can be really useful if you're in the flow of things and you don't need access to anything else, or you can hit tab and you'll get all of the stuff on the outside. So let's go through a quick rundown of what you can see on the screen here. So on the left, we have our pages tab. This shows us all the pages in our document, as well as our master pages. Now we're gonna come back to master pages in a little bit, but for now, we just wanna know all of our pages. Next, we have an assets tab. If in your version of Publisher, you don't have anything I'm talking about, or you wanna get things like the assets tab, Almost always you're gonna find it up in window and it'll be one of these checkboxes. So click assets and the assets tab will appear. The assets tab will persist across projects. So all of your publisher documents will have access to the same assets and it allows you to drag them in really quickly. So you can see I've got a bunch of stuff like logos for social media, logos for Icarus, as well as some side quest specific assets like being able to pull in backgrounds for images really easily or being able to pull in the side quest logo if I wanna use Use that or some default picture frames which we'll come to later on which I can use to fill out the page when I don't know what art assets I have yet. You do also have access to some stock assets through the stock tab. I don't tend to use that very much for my particular documents but it's nice to have that baked in. And then a Publisher 2 specific thing is books. This isn't something that's available in Publisher 1 but it allows you to take several Publisher documents and fuse them together into a book where each of the documents makes up a chapter. Really useful if, like me, you've got a monthly syndication magazine and you want to make an annual of it, you can just pull 12 of those issues, 12 individual documents, fuse them into a book, and then do a little bit of tidy up. That's beyond the scope of what we're going to do today, but it is available, but only in Publisher 2. Then along the left here, we've got all of our usual things like text boxes and table tools, drawing tools, all that kind of stuff. And then up top here, we have the workspaces, or well, they call them persona in this. Persona! So we're currently in the publisher persona, but we can switch to designer, which changes the type of tools we have available, or we can switch over to pixel persona, which is photo persona in this version. And again, that gives us a different set of tools and lets us do different things within the document. We're gonna come back to that a little bit later on, but for now, we'll keep moving on and we wanna go over to this right-hand side where we're gonna get our color swatches. This is for changing the color of anything, as well as choosing from different swatches. And you can download specific swatches as well. Like I have a metallic gradients swatch, which I use for titles sometimes. Or you have stroke, which will allow you to select a, let's say a rectangle, switch over to stroke and we can change how wide we want the lines to be and what we want them to look like. Pretty standard desktop publishing stuff. Going down a layer, we have our layers section that'll show us where the arrangement of all the different items is on the page. So if we go ahead into assets and just grab a couple of different ones here, you can see we can reorganize them, change what arrangement they are in. We can also make them invisible or enable them. We can do a whole bunch of stuff with that. And then at the bottom of our layers tab, we've got the effects and adjustments. Now this is going to get into slightly more advanced territory, but if we go ahead and click on an item and hit the effects tab, we'll get a little pop-up and we'll get a bunch of different options for effects. So we get the option to bevel and emboss things, change the, them to have an outline or a shadow or a glow or blur them. The blur can be really handy if you're working on kind of background information kind of blowing out elements of your background can make it look really funky but you've got all those options there and then you also have the adjustments tool so you click on that and you get a whole bunch of options to adjust color saturation vibrancy all that kind of stuff and then right at the bottom we have the transform tool this is going to allow you to move things around on the page change the orientation of it and the rotation and all that good stuff archon studios are returning to kickstarter with their dungeons and lasers line and this time they're funding a brand new campaign set in the world of deus lair deus lair is a dark fantasy setting filled with epic battles fantastic beasts and moral dilemmas where there is no clear right and wrong this campaign includes a set in 
book, which introduces the world of Deus Lair, as well as the unique peoples that inhabit it, and a full bestiary for the many new monsters and enemies introduced in the campaign. And speaking of monsters, the campaign is found in more than 400 different miniatures, which is the main reason to back it. Dungeons and Lasers have become known for giving buckets of minis in their Kickstarters, and Deus Lair is no exception. There are miniatures for the new factions, monsters, and playable races of Deus Lair, and you can also pick up some of their legacy miniatures from older Dungeons and Lasers campaigns here too. All of the miniatures are made from injection molded plastic, there's none of that PVC material here, and they all come in multi-part pieces on sprues. The project goes live on April the 11th, but the sign-up page is linked in the video description for you to go and get notified of the launch. A big thanks to Archon Studios for supporting the channel, now back to the video. So to show you what publisher can really do, I'm going to go ahead and open up my side quest template. This is the kind of baseline that I work from anytime I make an issue of SideQuest. We're going to give you a little tour of the master page and some of the functionality there and then show you how I would import some information to make an article to write a product. So I'm going to start off by jumping into the master page and give you a quick tip. First of all, I have a master page called Graphics Dump. This is like the assets page but it's a place where I can put certain information that kind of won't go into the assets page. So you can't drag just anything into the assets page. It won't allow you to put everything in there. So I have this master page, doesn't get applied to anything on my actual document, but it's useful for me to be able to keep the layout of my monster stat blocks or my call out boxes, or particularly my artist credits and the positioning of them in the getter. I can copy that paste that onto a page, replace the names, and it puts it exactly where it needs to be. Then if we go into the main kind of page for the master template here in the side quest template, we have the index. Now this is what most of the content in my magazine will appear on. It's a two page spread. It's got asymmetrical trade dress, which is just the fancy name for everything that appears on the page that isn't art and words. So all this background stuff, this is trade dress. Anytime you've cracked open a third party book or a D&D &D book, you'll see in the copyright bit in the open gaming license, one of the things that's excluded from being included in the open game license is always trade dress. That's what this is. It's just how the page looks. As far as trade dress goes, mine is fairly simple. We've got a couple of different graphic elements and some texturing details that we've all done through Affinity. So we're going to start here at the top and we're just going to grab an element. So this is, this is a little textural element and to do this I went into the pixel persona I chose the brush tool and I chose one of the texture stamps I don't remember exactly which one but you choose the texture stamp and then you can draw texture on your page and it applies it as a layer so that's all this is is just some brushed on texture just to give that aged parchment look it's really soft it's really subtle but it goes a long way to making a difference between a plain white page. Similarly, there's also a couple of colored gradients on the page. If I turn one of these off, you can see that it does make a difference to the top of the page, turns it much more white. But if we turn it on, you can see there's just this little bit of parchment-y cream colored texture at the top, just makes the page a little bit more visually interesting, but we fade it out quite aggressively so the middle of the page is still almost white. This helps make the page much more readable than it would be if there was a color all the way behind it. It makes the text much more legible, but it makes the page a little bit more interesting. Then we come to the trade dress on the outer edge. So we've got this arrow detail, all of this cornering detail. All of this trade dress was done by Ramona Alderdoodles. I'll leave a link to her Twitter profile in the description below. She does excellent work. She's done a whole bunch of design and layout work for me in the past. And this is going to appear on every page. So we've got this arrow set on the left and then on the right we've got this little banner where we have our article names so in each issue we tend to have three or four articles i'll go through here and i'll change the article names to be named after the articles and then when we're done we will link all of those articles to this so on each page there is a hyperlink to each of the articles another thing that we do on the master page is we insert some page numbers and to do this we select a text box we go into text and then insert fields and page number once you've gone ahead and made it and it will appear as this little hash symbol and that will give you the page number of the document in the live view of it. So we go ahead here and click on page 13 You see it updates automatically to page 13. Another thing I like to do here is I also like to 
add an interactive element to the page numbers on each page. So it's a hyperlink and I link that hyperlink to an anchor and the anchor, when they're set up, it'll be the contents page. So when you have this final document, you can click on the page number of any page, it'll take you back to the contents page. The contents page is hyperlinked to take you to any of the articles, and then you have that sidebar on the right to jump between articles. Makes it much easier to navigate around when you're looking at something in PDF. I also export with bookmarks, I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, but it just improves the overall digital reading experience. In terms of accessibility features, unfortunately Affinity doesn't have screen reader support. This is something that I have been pestering them on Twitter for like two years now and they keep saying, oh, it's on the list to do, but it hasn't been done yet, which is a real shame and a real disappointment. And it's the one thing that makes me want to use Adobe products over the Affinity Suite is the Adobe products have that built-in screen reader support to be able to add alt text to images and to be able to organize the information on the page so that the screen reader knows what order to read it in. If you don't have that, like in Affinity, a screen reader can sometimes have real trouble passing two column text, especially when you have different graphical elements interrupting it, it will jump really weirdly across the page and can be a really kind of horrible experience to have if you are someone that uses a screen reader. It's top of my list for things for Affinity to add to this suite. And if I was made of money, I would just use the Adobe suite so that I could have that option. So we've got our template all set up. The first thing that we're gonna wanna do for our issue is we wanna add our cover image. Wherever possible, I like to use images from Dean Spence. He makes amazing covers and all kinds of filler pieces. If you're someone who's looking to get into publishing in TTRPGs, Stock Art is absolutely your friend. It's a much cheaper way for you to be able to make your products look really beautiful without having to break the bank to commission pieces and without having to use like ugly free images. So for this issue, there's a recent piece by Dean Spencer that I really like, it's called Delving. And we're gonna drag that into our document. Now you can see it's oversized. So we wanna hold control shift and W so that we can see our guidelines. And we wanna make sure that that is aligned with our bleed. And then we're gonna go ahead and drag this all the way to the bottom so we can see how it interacts with the Sidecrest logo. And one thing that I like to do is I like to have elements interact with that logo. It makes it feel a little bit more 3D, makes it look a little bit more interesting. Now, normally I would have that interactable element and one of the ways to do that would be with this torch here. Unfortunately, the torch has a lot of light bloom and cutting that out would be really awkward. But I will show you briefly, we'll make this larger so it's the, the guy as the main focus. And I'll show you very broadly how I go about layering options over. So I'm gonna hit Control and J to duplicate my layer. Then I'm gonna drag this one right up to the top. So it's over everything. I'm gonna grab my crop tool and crop out everything that's not over the side crest logo. And let's say I just wanted his head here. So I'm gonna crop just to his head, just to make my life a little bit quicker and easier like this and then hit V to come out of crop. Then I'm gonna select that top layer image, head over to the pixel persona, hit the E key to open up the eraser and just start erasing out the boundary of that image. So it looks like his head specifically is sticking over the side quest logo. So if we do that and then come back into our main view and come out, it looks like there are layers to that cover image makes it look a lot more interesting. Like I said, we're not gonna do that with this image because the flames have that bloom of light. It would look really weird doing that. But wherever possible, I do like to have some play in front of the logo. I think it looks really nice. So with our cover all set up, it's time to start adding some content to the magazine. And to do this, we're gonna use the Engine of Elemental Destruction Adventure written by John Webb for the magazine. So we're gonna go ahead and open that adventure in the format it was given to me, which is a Word document. And we're just gonna grab, copy and paste all of the text, and then we're gonna put it into our magazines. So with all our text copied, we're just gonna hit paste and you can see I've already set up some text blocks. I've just dragged them in using the text frame tool. And then to link all of these up, when we click on a text box, you can see there's a little arrow here. When the text overflows, it gives you this little red eye icon. If we click that and click another text box, it will overflow. And we're just gonna do that for all of these text boxes here so that they overflow into 
as many pages as we need. And then we're gonna start setting up everything to do with the final look of the text. Now, the way that we wanna do this is with text styles. I already have several set up for this template that I use for SideQuest. But if we go over onto the right here when we've got a text box selected and hit text styles, you can see all of the text styles available in your document and you can make changes to them. The two that I use predominantly are first paragraph and main body. So if we go ahead and hit edit first paragraph here, you get a load of different options for changing the presentation of text. Specifically, you can change the font, the sizing, the spacing, paragraph leading, and a whole bunch of other options. Two important things to note when you are doing this, you wanna be very specific about what text you apply these styles to because when you change the style, if you change it for any reason, it will update all of that text and that can throw all kinds of problems into your project once it's hundreds of pages long. I speak from experience. So we we'll go ahead here and we'll change all of this text to be our first paragraph text. So go ahead, select it all, change it all to first paragraph. So you can see first paragraph text in this document is Garamond font in size 11. There's no indentation. I like using a serif font for print products. That's the ones that have got the little like bars on some of the letters. It's a little bit easier to read in printed format than in digital format. So what I wanna do now is we wanna go through and make sure all of the rest of the text is proper and fully formatted as it should be. So we're gonna start with the title. So we have a heading one setting, which is uniform across all of our things. It's nice, big, bold text. Then you see here, we've got a running the adventure title here. So we're gonna change that to be heading three. I always like to go from heading one to three. I use heading two sometimes, but not as much. And then you can see here, we've got a couple of paragraphs. We wanna set them up properly. We don't want there to be any space between them. So we're just gonna delete these. And then we're gonna take this second paragraph here. I'm gonna hit main body. And you can see all that really does is change the indentation there. So general rule of thumb that I like to use, first line of the first paragraph has no indentation. Every new paragraph after that gets an indentation. So the first paragraph gets that first paragraph textile. Everything else gets main body textiles. Now, obviously, how much work you have to do here depends on whether you're writing the content yourself, getting it from a third party writer, whether or not you've provided them with the guidelines for how to break up their text, all those kinds of things. But I always go through the text and make sure everything is set up properly to be that first paragraph and the main body, just so that it appears properly on the page. So one thing that you can see that I've also set up is with the first paragraph text, let's say I was writing this piece of content. When I finish a first paragraph and hard return by hitting enter, you can see it automatically indents and changes to body text. This just speeds the whole process up and means that you don't have to manually change things while you're writing them. You can do this by heading into the paragraph style and changing in style the next style. So you can choose what style you want it to follow when you hard return. So I'll just jump into our last month's issue, issue 21, to show you how this looks in its final form. So if we go ahead here and jump into this article, this is a Vinder's Vault article, Magical Items. You can see how all of this comes together. So we have our headings, our different text styles, the way they move between first paragraph and main body. We've got inserts for pictures and tables, and we make those bounce to the page by clicking on them and then going up here to text wrap settings, and that allows us to change it from jump to square or tight to change how the text interacts with the image. You can see here we've got the artist's credits, which are copied and pasted from the graphics dump. So if we go ahead and do that again, copy and paste, it will keep the positioning, which allows us to keep that spacing in the gutter, which is really important when it comes to printing. We have a different master page set up. So you can see this one here has slightly different trade dress, so it doesn't interact with this picture on the right hand side. Now, if we go ahead and show the guides, you can see on the headline of this article, this little anchor symbol. What that means is that that is set up so that other parts of the document can reference it. If we jump over into our index here and go to the Vendor's Vault option, we have the option to insert hyperlink and we can change that to change to be an anchor. And then we select our anchor to be Vendor's Vault. 
and change the style to be no style because we don't want it to end the line and things, but it allows us to link between different points in the document. When you set up anchors, you also have the option to set them up as PDF bookmarks, which means that when you export this document, you get the option for PDF bookmarks, which is really useful. So when it comes time to export a document, we're gonna go up to file and then hit export. It's gonna give us some pre-flight warnings. So that will tell us some information about our document. So if we open pre-flight, you can see there's a whole bunch of options here. Most of these are spelling mistakes because fantasy words, you know, the word processors don't know what to do with them, but some of them are things like hyperlink invalid. So we go onto this page and you can see that this is linking to an invalid page. Fortunately, this isn't a type of master page that we've used in this specific document. We don't need to worry about it. But the pre-flight, great way to figure out whether there's anything wrong with your document. Just be aware, spelling mistakes are gonna be the most common one because fantasy words. But you also get things like a bleed hazard. So if we click on that, it's gonna give us some options for a bleed hazard. All of those bleed hazards are gonna be this little index on the right here. I'm not worried about that because this specific magazine is digital first. So we don't need to worry about how this prints. When it comes to print, we bundle them all into an annual. The annual doesn't have that sidebar. But then when you're ready to actually export, you hit export, you ignore and continue, and then you get a pop-up window which will ask what you want to export it as. So in our case, we're going to export it as a PDF, and then we get several presets. So we get traditional print presets, so either press-ready, digital small size or high quality, and then several pre-existing options for print. But you can also make your own presets. It'll then ask you where you want to print. Do you want to print every page? the current page you're on, a page range, which is what this box down here is for. And then it gives you options for what you wanna do with all of your different specific printable options. So for example, do we wanna downsize our images if they're particularly large? That helps keep our file size smaller. Do we wanna use any image compression? What compatibility do we want? Do we want any color spaces to be included? Do we wanna include hyperlinks? Do we wanna include bookmarks, things like that? Do we wanna include our bleed and do we wanna embed our fonts? All these things aren't necessarily things that you wanna worry about if you're making digital first content, but as soon as you think about printing, all of this kind of stuff becomes really important, which is why I say if you're going to print primarily on drive RPG or DMs Guild, go and use their templates because it's going to save you a lot of headaches. And that's my brief introduction to how I use the Affinity Suite to make RPG products for sale and to hand to my players. If you've got any questions about using Affinity, post them in the comments below. If you haven't already, check out my video where I talk about the document that I made for my players for our most recent campaign that was made using Affinity. And until next time, happy gaming.